Now, I got to this week go to Washington, D.C. and be there on, De on December 1st, on Wednesday, when the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health case, which is a case that you're hearing a lot about lately and you'll hear a lot about uh, for a while until they issue their opinion. And probably in June is when it's expected um, and do something about Roe versus Wade. We don't know exactly what yet. Um, so we were there to report about it, to be witnesses there, uh, to testify um, it, it, to God's truth in that place and to, to live stream it, to let other people hear about it and to provide commentary about it. Uh, so I had uh, came straight from there and home on uh, Thursday and then turned right around and came here. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's good to care about what the Supreme Court does. It's good to care about it. Uh, we should care. We should care about what they do. Uh, a person who commits a wrong has the greatest duty to right that wrong. And the same is true for institutions. So we can care. We can and we should pray for the Supreme Court, pray for their repentance. We can even hope a little bit. We can hope, have some hope. But <clears throat> that care and that hope that we can and we should have can cross a line. That can cross a line, a very dangerous line, a line at which it becomes sin. And not just sin, but the worst kind of sin. Today I want to talk about the concept of what we call ignore row. Um, what does that mean? Well, there are a n number of components to a bill of abolition. Uh, you even have in your pamphlet there. Uh, kind of the, the, what we call the, ma the main criteria of the bill of abolition are two concepts that we call equal protection and ignore Roe. We call them that in, in shorthand. Uh, equal protection simply means that state laws protecting born people like you and me should be the same laws that protect people who are not yet born, but who are just as much people as you and I are. Uh, ignore Roe means that government officials should treat Roe versus Wade because it's unconstitutional, because it violates God's law, they should treat it as null and void, as of no effect, because it violates the U.S. Constitution, violates God's law, it's not the law of the land according to the terms of the Constitution itself. So we're saying to ignore a decision of the court because that decision violates a higher law and therefore it's not law. And I've spoken on many occasions about both of these concepts, but today I want to talk about specifically about the concept of ignoring Roe from a biblical perspective and how it's not just a, an option, it's not just something that we can do, it's something that we must do. That there's not an alternative. We must ignore Roe. If we're not ignoring Roe, then we're not obeying God. We must ignore Roe. I believe is what God would have us to do. God makes it clear in his word that we must defy any human order that would require us to disobey him. So if it comes down to obeying man or obeying God, the choice is a really easy one, a really easy choice. There's a lot of talk these days because of lots of things that the government is mandating. And when I say government, there's lots of forms of government, but I, I'm using it as shorthand like most people do for the civil government. The government's ordering lots of things, masks and lockdowns and vaccines and all sorts of things. So there's a lots of discussion, a lot of a healthy discussion that should be happening about what are the, what's the extent of the government's jurisdiction? What are, what are our duties to, to, to obey them? And how far do those duties go? You may have heard some say that if the government orders you to wear pinwheels on your head when you go to the store, then you must do that, right? Or we also have some <clears throat> who've said, uh, you may know well-known pastor John MacArthur, I'm grateful for so much of his work, uh, but he has said that he believes that the American colonies declaring independence in 1776 was unbiblical, that that was wrong. 
As he put it many years ago, quote, the United States was born out of a violation of Romans 13 in the name of Christian freedom. And yet, in the past year, we've seen him and his church defy an order of the state of California with regard to the meeting of the church. They, uh, he along with the other leaders of the church, uh, encouraged their congregation and led them to, and, and encouraged other churches to do what they did, which is to defy an order of the California government that banned singing, caps on church attendance, and prohibitions against gatherings and services. Well, how does that square with his earlier views? Is that some radical departure that he's seen, seen the light that, hey, jurisdictions are limited? I don't think so. I think he's being consistent. I think he's, he's, being, he's holding the same views that he always has. Um, because neither he nor Brother Todd Frill, who was the, the pin, mentioned the pinwheels on the hat, um, nor almost any Christian believe that the authority of the government is absolute, or at least they don't say that. I don't hear anyone arguing that the authority of the government is absolute. As John MacArthur put it when he wrote a letter about why their church was defying the California government, he said, when we wrote an article called Christ Not Caesar as the head of the church, that was our declaration that we would follow Jesus Christ and where the government told us to do something he told us not to do, or the government told us not to do something he commanded us to do, we would follow Christ. Did you hear that last part? He said that if the government told us to do something that Christ told us not to do, or the government told us not to do something that Christ told us to do, then we should follow Christ and, by implication, not follow, not obey the government. And this is, not, this is, a, this is no new concept. This is a very old concept. Now, now I believe that the lines should be drawn further than that. That if the government goes outside, its, outside of its jurisdiction, where God has not delegated to it authority, then even there we may disobey it. But there's, these are the innermost lines, right? Or the outermost lines, depending on how you, you want to think about it, uh, that Christians across the world throughout history have pretty much agreed that if the government tells you to do something that God says not to do, or the government tells you not to do something that God tells you to do, that's the line. That is the, at least that's the line. That we have to obey God rather than men at that point. And I want to show you that even from that line, that more limited, what I call a more limited view of civil disobedience, the concept of ignore Roe is biblically mandated. It's biblically required even within those lines. It's not just an option, it's a mandate. Again, the classic way of saying this argument, stating this argument, is that we must disobey the government when it commands us to do something that God forbids, or when it forbids us from doing something that God commands. And where does that come, come from? Where does that come from? Well, again, I'm going to be brief here because it's something almost everyone agree, agrees with. It's almost something everyone agrees with. Very few would argue, and again, I've never heard anyone argue, that citizens are bound to unconditional obedience to all earthly civil authorities. For one thing, that kind of obedience would be impossible. It would be physically impossible. Why? Because you have different, you have multiple civil authorities over you. And very frequently, they conflict with each other. It would be impossible for you to obey all civil authorities and what they're telling you to do. Right? Some are telling you you have to do this, and some are telling them you don't have to do this. Who do you obey? It's impossible. It's impossible to consistently obey because they are consistently making inconsistent orders. But more importantly, unconditional obedience to civil authorities would be disobedience to God. Uh, most obviously, requiring unconditional submission to civil authorities would implicitly force people to disobey God's commands. Because they not only often issue orders that conflict with one another, they also often issue orders that conflict with God's law. And it's, it's today more, more often than it has been in a long time. 
And that happens when they order us to do something God forbids or forbid us from doing something that God's commands. <clears throat> so how does the civil government sometimes order us to do something that God forbids? Well, the most classic example of this from Scripture is the example of Pharaoh and the Hebrew midwives. That's an excellent example of this in Exodus chapter 6. Pharaoh ordered Shifra and Pua to commit infanticide, to kill all male Hebrew children at birth. And my daughter, who's actually traveling with me today, actually her middle name is Shifra, named after this, one of the Hebrew midwives. We thought about Pua, but we went with Shifra instead. Um, so he, Pharaoh had ordered Shifra and Pua to kill all Hebrew children, all male Hebrew children at birth. Problem with that, God had forbidden that. God had forbidden that. It's like, well, Bradley, but we didn't have the Ten Commandments yet. But God had already forbidden that. Explicitly, in Genesis chapter 9 to Moses, God issues the very first criminal uh, prohibition, which is whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Right? Making it a crime, not just for Israel, but for everyone to commit murder. And implicitly, God had prohibited murder in Genesis chapter 4, story of Cain and Abel. Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, where God curses the whole earth with a flood. Why? Because, among other things, the whole earth was filled with violence. God hated it. And Shifra and Pua knew that God hated the shedding of innocent blood. So there was a conflict between what God said and what Pharaoh said. There's a conflict between what Pharaoh was commanding them to do and what God had forbidden them from doing. And so, in response, what do the Hebrew midwives do? They obeyed God. They obeyed God. They chose to refrain from doing what God had forbidden, even though it meant violating the command of the civil authority of Pharaoh. And for their actions, or in this case, omissions, right, their inaction, their refusal to act, God blesses them. God blesses them for that. God, the scripture praises them and describes how God blesses them for refusing to follow the evil command of Pharaoh. So that's a ex clear example from scripture of us being blessed, of Christians being blessed when we refuse to, to do what God forbids, even when it's commanded by the civil authority. But what about an example of when the civil authority is forbidding us from doing something God commands? Not that we're being told to do something wrong, but we're being told that we can't do something right, something that we have a duty to do. Right? The orders of the civil authority can conflict with God's law if the civil authority forbids a person from doing something that God commands. The clearest biblical example of this, and, and this is like really easy. You know, God makes this, again, this is a very easy discussion. Because this one is found in Acts chapter 5. A very clear example. Very clear example. The apostles had been imprisoned by civil authorities. Yes, those civil authorities were also religious authorities, but at that time, they also had civil authority. You know how you know that? Because they put them in prison, right? <laughs> they put them in prison, and they did so for teaching in the name of Jesus. And those authorities reminded the apostles that they were forbidden from teaching in the name of Jesus. And yet, what did the apostles do? They did it anyways, even though they had been forbidden from doing so. Why? Because, as the apostles explained to the civil authorities in Acts chapter 5, we must obey God rather than men. Does that mean we never obey men? God forbid. No pun intended. Right? But we are to obey men within their jurisdictions, and most importantly, when what they're telling us does not command us to do what God forbids or forbids us from doing what God commands. When they do that, 
then we must obey God rather than men. In other words, when God commands us to do something that the government says not to do it, we do it anyways. If we don't, we're disobeying God. And we're treating the authority of the government above God's authority. And God has said, you shall have no other gods before me. So you may be saying, okay, tracking, I get it, I agree. Now what does this have to do with abortion? I'm glad you asked that question. What this has to do with abortion is that Roe versus Wade is an order from the government that orders someone both to do what God forbids and forbids someone from doing what God commands. That's why it must be defied. It must be ignored. We must obey God rather than men. Okay. Okay, but you may be saying now, okay, I, I get, okay, I get, I get that. But Roe versus Wade doesn't command me to do anything. Roe versus Wade doesn't forbid me from doing anything. So what are you talking about? All Roe versus Wade does is, is it allows me to do something, right? It allows mothers to have their children aborted. So then how does it command me to do something that God commands? It's, it's, there's not forced abortion in this country, thank God, like there is in some others. So how does it force me to do something that God forbids or forbids me from doing something that God commands? It doesn't. It doesn't. That's true, it doesn't. So really, this, in some ways, this talk is not really about you, except it is. It is about you, because for most of us, Roe versus Wade doesn't command us to do something God forbids or forbids from doing something God commands. For most of us, it doesn't. But that's not the end of the analysis. You know, sometimes when we read scripture, we can get very myopic. We can look at it, as we should, through my eyes, right? Through our own eyes, right? We, we read scripture, I read scripture, and, I, and the things that pertain to men, husbands, fathers, lawyers, right? Those are things that jump out at me. But I don't read the scripture through the eyes of a politician, a civil magistrate, a king, right? I, I, no, I read those passages, but they don't sink in the same way that the passages do that, that are where I am. Children reading the Bible may overlook commands to parents because they're not parents. Whereas I see the commands of parents and I see the commands to children. And I remind my children about those. Right? Those are some of my favorites. Children, obey your parents. Similarly, we do the same thing when we come to the Bible. We come as citizens. Right? In our role as citizens. And we read the Bible as citizens. And so, we don't see how Roe versus Wade is commanding us to do something that God forbids or forbids something that God commands because we're reading the Bible as citizens. We don't see it as easily. We have to look harder to see it through the eyes, the commands to, to civil officials. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, um, there are commands to kings. Now, I can quote to you passages from Deuteronomy 6. Many of you can. Many fathers can. Right? About duties to teach our children, right? But can you tell me the duties to kings that God lays out in Deuteronomy chapter 17? Now you've probably read them and you may remember them somewhat, but they don't sink in the same way that those do to fathers if you're a father. Why? Because you're not a king. You're not a king, nor have you ever thought that you would be, or maybe you have, but I've never thought. That I, that I would be. And that's where we get messed up. Because Roe versus Wade is not an order to you and me as citizens. Go look at Roe versus Wade. Go look at Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the 1992 decision that even though there was a 
eight Republican justices on the court and the one Democrat was pro-life still doubled down on Roe versus Wade. I can't mention that decision without reminding everyone of that every chance I get. Um, go look at that decision. That, that decision, at the end of it, like almost every other Supreme Court decision, it ends with these words. It is so ordered. It is so ordered. That's what, how Roe versus Wade ends. It is so ordered. Well, that order is not to you, dear citizen, fellow citizen. That order is not to you. Who is that order to? It's to public officials. It's to elected officials. It's to bureaucrats. It's to, as scripture often calls them, magistrates. Magistrates. And I'll just put them all under that label. Magistrates. The order in Roe versus Wade is an order not to us as citizens, but an order to magistrates. It's an order to magistrates. So getting back to the original discussion, does that order in Roe or Casey or any of the other decisions, does it, do, does it command those magistrates to do something that God forbids or forbids them from doing something that God commands? That is the question. In order to answer that question, we have to look at what does God command? And what does he forbid? Magistrates. What does he command magistrates to do? What does he forbid magistrates to do? What are his positive commands? His thou shalts. And what are his negative prohibitions on magistrates? The thou shalt nots. And if we know those, then we can examine Roe in light of that and see should magistrates follow Roe or not. So what are some of God's positive commands to magistrates regarding this issue? What are some things that God commands magistrates to do? First, he has some general commands to magistrates on this subject of justice. He has general commands. Jeremiah 22, 3. I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture. A lot of scripture. Praise the Lord. That he's given us very clear instruction here. And, and more importantly for this talk, he's given magistrates very clear instruction. Jeremiah 22, 3, thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness. Amos 5, 15, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. Who should establish justice in the gate? The ones who are sitting in the gates. Who, who's sitting in the gates? Magistrates. These scriptures I'm reading you are all to magistrates. Ezekiel 45, 9, thus says the Lord God, enough, O princes of Israel, magistrates, put away violence and oppression and execute justice and righteousness. Jeremiah 21, 12, O house of David, the kings, magistrates, thus says the Lord, execute justice in the morning. Get your day started with some justice. Execute justice in the morning. And deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it. Sounds like God takes that pretty seriously. Lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. Wait, what were their evil deeds? Not executing justice. Jesus even rebukes the scribes and Pharisees who were in part civil authorities, like we talked about, because they did not do justice. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, magistrates, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. I could go on. But God also has not just general commands to execute justice, but he also has specific commands that apply specifically to what we're talking about here. Isaiah 1, 16 through 17, God says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless. 
Bring justice to the fatherless, God says. I had someone come up to me after I um, preached this one time, and they, they said, well, how are the, how are the preborn the fatherless? And, and I said, they are the most fatherless from a legal perspective, from a justice perspective. They are the most fatherless of all. The fathers have zero legal standing to be able to speak on behalf of their children, even if they wanted to. These children are, for all legal purposes, fatherless children. They're fatherless children. So when it comes to justice, these are the fatherless more than anybody else. These are the fatherless. A few verses later, God rebukes the magistrates because they are not doing what he commanded. Isaiah 123, your princes, magistrates, are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless. Jeremiah 5.28, they have grown fat and sleek. Who's that? The magistrates. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not. Who judges? Magistrates. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the needy. They are sinning against God, not for what they are doing, but for what they are not doing. For what they are failing to do. Psalm 82, 2-3. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. That is a positive command of God. Can you and I give justice? We have not been given the sword. So we can call for it, but we can't give it. Who can give it? The magistrates. They're ordered to do so by God. So just as God has positive commands to magistrates on this issue, he also has negative prohibitions. He has thou shalt nots that he also gives to magistrates. He has general ones and specific ones. Generally, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 1, 16 and 17, God says, And I charged your judges at that time, magistrates, you shall not... So now here's a prohibition from God. We've seen orders and commands from God. Now we're seeing the prohibitions from God. What God forbids. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall not be partial. What, is that, what does partiality mean? Well, you've seen the scales of justice. Partiality is unequal weights and measures, as God also calls an abomination in Scripture. Partiality means that you judge someone differently based upon something other than the merits of the case, something other than their conduct. You judge them differently based upon their status, their wealth or their poverty, their, their sex, their skin color, their what have you, something other than their conduct. That's showing partiality in judgment. And God forbids that. He hates unequal weights and measures. Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20, you shall appoint judges and officers, magistrates, in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. He forbids perverting justice. You shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Leviticus 19.15 You shall do no injustice in court. The magistrates. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Proverbs 18.5 it is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the, the righteous of justice. Exodus 23, I told you there would be a lot of scripture. Exodus 23, 2 through 3, You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many so as to pervert justice. 
nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. So that's God's general prohibition where God for, forbids partiality in judgment, forbids magistrates from showing partiality. But God also has specific prohibitions on this issue. Deuteronomy 24, 17, you shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless. You shall not pervert the justice due to the fatherless. Exodus 22, 22 through 24. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, says God, and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wife shall become widow and your children fatherless. Jeremiah 22, 3, Thus says the Lord, Do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. It's almost like God knew what we were going to do. Deuteronomy 27, 19, Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner. The fatherless and the widow and all the people shall say amen. amen. I didn't hear enough amens. Amen. God commands you to say amen. amen. All right. It says, Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the fatherless and all the people shall say amen. amen. That's right. I'm just telling you what he commands. You're not amening me, you're amening him, as we should. Jeremiah 7, 5 through 7, God says, For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. These are God's conditions of peace. We can have peace if we, in, the, in this passage, simply refrain from doing what he forbids. So what is Roe versus Wade? Roe versus Wade is an order. It is so ordered, says the Supreme Court. It's an order by the Supreme Court to magistrates. God's given orders to magistrates. Supreme Court's given orders to magistrates. And Roe forbids magistrates from doing what God commands magistrates to do. Roe forbids magistrates from obeying God's commands. God tells magistrates to execute justice. Roe says, do not execute justice, magistrates. You're forbidden from executing justice. Roe says, execute justice for the fatherless. Roe says, do not execute justice, especially for the fatherless. Roe tells magistrates, do not do what God says to do. So whom should the magistrates serve? Whom should they serve? Roe tells states and our officials in the states that we may not enforce bans on abortion. Roe says that we may not enforce homicide laws to stop abortion. But God commands magistrates to execute justice for the fatherless, and Roe forbids them from doing so. That's enough. That's enough. Like, like the apostles, we must obey God rather than men. That's enough. But Roe goes more beyond that. It not only forbids the magistrates from doing something that God commands, Roe also commands magistrates to do something that God forbids. God forbids partiality in judgment. God tells magistrates in no uncertain terms, do not show partiality in judgment. Roe tells magistrates, you must 
show partiality and judgment. Rose says magistrates must treat the homicide of a born person differently than an unborn person. Rose says magistrates must treat the murder of a pre-born child differently than the murder of a born child. Rose says magistrates must treat prenatal homicide by the mother differently than prenatal homicide by anyone who doesn't have her consent. And that's why just last week there was a man convicted, and rightfully so, of murdering a preborn child in the womb of his girlfriend. And yet, if she had gone, or if she had d done it herself, no legal consequences. That's partiality. If ever there was partiality, that's partiality. If the word partiality means anything, it means that's wrong. It means that that is wrong. And God prohibits showing partiality. But Roe commands the showing of partiality. And so whom should they serve? Whom should the magistrates serve? Whom should they obey? Romans 13, many of you have read it many times. I've spoken about it many times. I know it's been spoken about from this pulpit many times. But we can talk about it some more. Romans 13 says, For every soul to be subject to the governing authority. Okay. And again, you may be thinking about that through your own eyes. Put yourself in the shoes of the magistrate. Okay, magistrate, be subject to the governing authority. Wait, I am the governing authority. Well, you are, but there is a higher one. There is a higher one. God, of course, the highest of all, but even man's law, there is a higher authority. Be subject to it. Oh, are you talking about the Supreme Court? Well, I mean, the Supreme Court is a governing authority. And as long as they're within their jurisdiction, then they are a higher authority. But there's an even higher authority than that that you owe allegiance to, that you've sworn an oath to, and that is the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution. So magistrates, obey Romans 13. Be subject to the governing authority. For there's no authority except that, that appointed by God. You need to obey that. Romans 13 says, obey the governing authority magistrates and the highest law of the land, right, man's law, the highest law of the land is this constitution and the laws which shall be made in pursuance thereof. Well, the constitution says, no state shall deny to any person within this jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. You know that phrase, equal protection of the laws? That doesn't mean equal outcomes, or that doesn't mean that everyone is actually equal, equally protected in a real way, right? Some people will still, still not be protected. Some people will still be murdered. But it's equal protection of the laws. You know what equal protection of the laws means? Impartiality. That's all it means. No state shall deny, right? There's a, we're forbidden in the U.S. Constitution from partiality. That's really all equal protection of the laws means is don't show partiality in judgment. That's really all it's saying. It's just reflection of God's law. That's why we use that phrase, equal protection. Because it's a shorthand way of saying what God says. Just do not show partiality in judgment. So civil magistrates, don't show partiality. Do not deny equal protection. Oh, there's some other authority who's telling you not to obey that? There's some lesser authority under the Constitution, created by the Constitution, that's a creature of the Constitution, that's telling you not to obey the Constitution? Well, you must obey God rather than men, and God says be subject to the governing authority, which is the Constitution, which is higher than the Supreme Court. And God says to obey the governing authority. Here's another thing. This is just an interesting thought that I've had. Psalm 82, I read a little bit of it earlier. It's a fantastic passage on this issue. The whole chapter is. But it, it's, it's 
part of it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Wait, 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 wait a second. I thought there was only one God. I thought there was only one God. Right, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Why, what, why are we talking about other gods? Well, because the term gods here isn't talking about divine beings. As Calvin, Wesley, Spurgeon, Luther, Gill, the Geneva Bible all speak about this passage. Here the term gods is not referring to divine beings, right? Why would God be giving to orders, giving orders to someone who doesn't exist, right? God isn't talking here to divine beings. When he uses the word gods here, as even Jesus points out in the New Testament, because God because Jesus points out, hey, I said you were gods. Who is he speaking to? Magistrates. And here it's very clear that we're speaking about rulers and judges. We're speaking about magistrates. In fact, it's, it's so clear, it's obvious. Psalm 82, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly? Okay, he's talking to judges. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. It's God's command of magistrates. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. And that same word for God used in Psalm 82 is also used in Psalm 97. But it's also the same word for gods that's used in Exodus 23, chapter 20, verse 3, which says, You shall have no other gods before me. And of course, God is talking about, you shall have no other supposed divine beings that you worship before me. But I believe he's also saying, you shall have no other earthly judges and rulers before me, above me. You shall have no other gods before me. We must not worship false gods, but we must also not elevate the authority of earthly rulers and judges above the one who gave them that authority. Because to do so is idolatry. And that's why I said at the beginning, you may have thought, oh, that's hyperbole to call this the worst of sins. But this is what God says is the worst of sins. This is what God begins the Ten Commandments with. You shall have no other gods before me. Idolatry is the chief of sins. You shall have no other gods before me. We must not worship false gods, but we must not also not elevate the authority of men above God. That's idolatry. Magistrates who comply with Roe versus Wade are sinning against God. When you write a bill that complies with Roe versus Wade, that tries to work within Roe versus Wade, that submits to Roe versus Wade, that bows down to Roe versus Wade, you're sinning against God. When you bow to another authority, you're sinning against God. When God commands something that that authority forbids, or when that authority forbids something that, that God commands, they're violating God's clear commands. They're engaged in civil idolatry. The first talk I ever gave as an abolitionist in 2016 was entitled, Abortion, the Supreme Court, and Civil Idolatry. This has been a theme for a long time. Because I believe that when the people say, what's the greatest problem in America? I believe idolatry. Because we're obeying God, we're obeying man rather than God. We've elevated the law of man above the law of God. We are bowing to the image of Nebuchadnezzar even when God forbids us from doing that. We're submitting to a king who's telling, our magistrates are submitting to a king who is telling them to violate God's order rather than submitting to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So what we call for shorthand, ignore Roe, is not just a biblical option. It's not just an option, 
So I was just like, you know, we may ignore Roe. Yeah, we may. That's an option. No. It's a biblical command. We must ignore Roe. And who's that command to? Magistrates. Magistrates. So we must go to them. As, as Leviticus calls us, the people of the land, we must go to our magistrates and demand, especially since we are also magistrates in this country, we are also magistrates. We don't have the full power of the sword, but we have the power of the vote, which means that we're under greater duty to go to those for whom we vote and to call them to obey God. This isn't just like a king that has no accountability to us. These are magistrates that we are electing, that we are choosing, who represent us, that we have a, we have a certain amount of the authority of magistrates, at least in the choosing of them. So we have a duty to go to them and to call them to obey God. Magistrates who comply with Roe versus Wade are sinning against God. Magistrates who properly resist Roe versus Wade are obeying God and will be blessed. So we submit to the civil authority within their jurisdiction when their commands do not conflict with God's law. But when they do conflict with God's law, when they command what God forbids or forbid what, forbids what God commands, then our magistrates must obey God rather than men. They must ignore Roe. So, I came from the Supreme Court this week. It's good to care about what they do. It's good to care. It's good to pray for them. For the last 49 years of counting, however, we've crossed a line. We've crossed a line in the, in the anti-abortion community, in the pro-life community. We've crossed a line in how much we care. We've crossed a line in how much we hope. We've crossed a line and we've done something that God forbids, that God explicitly forbids us in Scripture. God says, do not put your trust in princes. And that's not just the magistrates. That's not to the princes he's saying that. That's to you. That's to me. Do not put your trust in princes. It seems like that's a problem that, that man has. That's a problem that man has, putting our trust in princes. That's a problem that the pro-life movement has had for 49 years and counting. Putting our trust in princes. So yeah, you should care. You should hope. You should pray. But you don't put your trust there. You don't put your trust there. December 1st, three days ago. Wait, what's the day? Yeah. It's been a busy week. Three days ago, there were people out in front of the Supreme Court, and they were calling on the Supreme Court to do the right thing, and that's good. The Supreme Court should do the right thing. They should do the right thing. But I went to a, a dinner that evening and I, I was invited there because we had filed a brief uh, with the Supreme Court. Uh, also signed on to by Rescue Those, host of this conference, and many other organizations you know and love. Uh, we had submitted a brief, and so a pro-life organization, who also does lots of other things, lots, lots of great things, uh, invited me and all the people who had filed brief, all the attorneys who had filed brief to this meeting, or to this uh, dinner, that I showed up, and it turned out to be way more than just, you know, a total egghead nerd fest of attorneys. It was like the who's who of the pro-life movement. And what I heard just hours after those arguments in front of the Supreme Court, what I heard from the stage from the host was was a statement that said, the states may not do anything to restrict abortion without the Supreme Court 
saying we can. And so that's why this case is so important. That was from the stage. This isn't just a myth we've been telling you about. This isn't just, this isn't just some legend that we've created. This is what has been coming from the mouths of the leaders of the pro-life movement for 49 years. This kind of idolatry is what has been coming from the mouth of this pro-life movement for the last 49 years. This is why when we did our live stream right before the Supreme Court heard their old arguments, I said, behold your God. They got to stand in front of the Supreme, of the Supreme Court building right behind me. Behold your God. Behold our God. And how is it a God? Because we have been treating its authority as being higher than God's. Well, I haven't been worshiping it. Oh, you've been worshiping it all right. You have been worshiping it. Because God, and I'm going way off script here, but because, like, I don't, this is, I'm not even in my notes. Um, but you have been worshiping it. You know what God says about worship? He says, I don't care about your sacrifices. I don't care about your worship. That's about your songs and about your assemblies. I don't care about that in the sense that that's secondary. God commands that. God commands your singing and your praises and your sacrifices. Absolutely. But he says, put all that away from me because you know what's better than that? Obedience. God said through the prophet to Saul, the king, the magistrate, he said, obedience is greater than sacrifice. And so you want to know who someone serves, who they worship? Just look at who they're obeying. So I disagree with what was said from the stage at that event. And there were a couple times that there were standing ovations given that I and Wes Thomas, who was with me, just sat in our chairs and were like the only people not standing up. So that was awkward. But it was, it was, it was great to be there, though, to be reminded and to be inspired that this is what we've been talking about. This is what we've been talking about. We filed this brief with the U.S. Supreme Court, and some people said, like, well, why are you filing a brief if you think they're not God? It's like, well, no, we, we still go to them, and we call them to do what's right. They still should do what's right. But I want to read you a part of this brief. In the United Kingdom, members of Parliament have long been required to swear an oath to the monarch. Even today, the oath reads, I swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Our oaths of office in the United States are different. Here, the, the government of the United States was founded to be a government of laws and not of men. This simply means that America was designed as a constitutional republic and not a monarchy or oligarchy. Lex Rex, the law is king, not Rex Lex, the king is law. Reflecting that principle, public officials in the United States generally swear an oath not to a person, to a group of persons, or even to an institution. Instead, almost all public officials in this country swear an oath to a written document, the Constitution. Notably, none of them swear an oath of allegiance to this court. Nor does anything in the Constitution bind them to the court's opinions unconditionally. American public officials are oath-bound to follow are oath-bound to follow the court insofar as the court follows the Constitution, but not farther. Of course, deference should be given to the court in interpreting the Constitution, but not unconditional submission. If the court demands unconditional submission, it makes itself a tyrant. If we grant it unconditional submission, we make it an idol. Instead, the court should submit to the highest authority from whom it derives its powers, and the people should appeal to the ultimate lawgiver from whom all powers are delegated, as I talked about earlier in the brief. If the court itself fails to restrain its authority within its legitimate bounds, its actions will impel public officials obliged, that is, obligated, 
to fulfill their own constitutional and God-given duties to pursue other avenues to do so. Concerning this case, the case of Dobbs that we heard this week, Roe and its judicial progeny have purported to authorize the prenatal homicide of more than 2,300 American people each day on average. The daily flow of this Nile River of blood in our land cries out loudly for justice, which the members of the court are themselves oath-bound to administer. So help me God. However, the court is not only failing to administer justice in this respect, it is actively standing in the way of it. Inevitably, as history demonstrates, when justice is consistently denied by an institution commissioned to provide it, the demand for justice will seek fulfillment from another source. Of course, amici, that is friends of the court that we came as, not friends of Roe, but friends of the constitutional institution of the court, of course, we repudiate violent acts of aggression through vigilantism or mob action. Furthermore, we oppose popular revolution. That is, revolution led by just the general populace and not by magistrates, the lesser magistrates. Instead, there are numerous constitutional avenues available at both the federal and state levels for public officials to seek to secure the right to life through current civil institutions. Certainly, it would be best for the court to right its own wrong, and we request it does so here. However, the court has so far refused. It has continued to violate the rule of law by maintaining the underlying holding of Roe and its judicial progeny. As a result, citizens, public officials, and civil institutions still desiring to faithfully follow God and the Constitution can, should, and more and more are seeking redress via other peaceful constitutional avenues to abolish abortion in order to rescue their pre-born neighbors who are being led to the slaughter. That's what we said to the court, among other things. So the Christians in this country for 49 years have crossed the line that I talked about earlier. Yeah, we should care. The Supreme Court should do their duty. But we've crossed the line in how much we care. And we've been putting our trust there. And we've been obeying God rather than men. And we've been letting our magistrates get away with. We've been even telling them they need to obey God. I'm sorry, obey men rather than God. We have judgment in our land because of it. And the answer to judgment is always repentance. Repentance is our only hope. We do not put our trust in princes. And where we have, and oh, we have, we should repent. We should put our trust in the name of the Lord our God. I'm going to close with Joshua chapter 24, 14 through 15. Joshua speaking to the children of Israel after conquering, mostly, the promised land. Joshua said, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Put away the gods that your fathers have served for the last 49 years and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose. Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, as for this movement, as for the movement of abolition, we will serve the Lord. Thank you.